Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Sina, uh, and good morning. Um, let me firstly uh, extend my uh, gratitude to the uh, to Professor Barbara Redmond, uh, Provost, Universitas 21, um, and also Professor Kathy Amar, uh, Universitas 21 Teaching, Learning and Innovation Chair, but also more importantly to yourselves as uh, delegates. And I really want to get straight into the uh, into the issues. Now, I'm sure we uh, are all familiar with, um, and I'm not going to try and uh, go into, the uh, evolution or, uh, of industrial revolutions and how they are connected and all of that. But I also don't want to, to enter into the debates around whether the fourth industrial revolution actually exists or whether it's a construct um, and whether we're talking about industry 3.5, 4.0 or 5.0 because I think those are some of the uh, engagements that uh, you know are thrown around. But I think the Vice Chancellor of this university articulated uh, this quite eloquently uh, recently in a research colloquium on the implications of the fourth industrial revolution for post-school education and, uh, and training. So I'd really want to work from that premise, that there is sufficient evidence for all those, I mean for all to see that we're experiencing changes, dramatic changes in how we live our lives, how we communicate and interact with each other, with the fiscal world, with machines, how we learn, how we work, and also how we solve problems. So therefore, the label we use to define this new complexity and the technological tools that accompanies it or sometimes referred to as a threat and other times referred to as an opportunity, depending on who is speaking, I think for me is less important. Throughout the history of humankind, we've had to deal with changes. And I think it can be said that humans are probably dominant or a dominant species on Earth today precisely because of their adaptability towards change. But up to now, change has been more evolutionary uh, rather than revolutionary. So in the context of uh, the introduction Professor Sina uh, made uh, of me being a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, you would understand why I would view it more as being evolutionary change than it being revolutionary. And the change we are faced with now, I think is much more rapid, much more far-reaching, much more intense, and much more exponential. And we need to think of how rapidly we have moved from dial type, landline telephones, to video capable smartphones that are increasingly, uh, that increasingly control more and more aspects of our lives. There's no doubt, uh, there's no, uh, there, there, are no, there are no doubt many more sophisticated ex examples that you can actually think of. There are concerns whether we are uh, physiologically, socially, and physically ready to adapt effectively to the magnitude of change confront, uh, confronting us, which is why we need research informed rather than ad hoc responses to the hype, and why consortia such as Universitas 21 are vitally important in working out how we navigate the change and how we ensure that the fourth industrial revolution presents as an opportunity for advancing human development rather than as a threat to our very own existence. We cannot lose sight of the fact that while we grapple with making sense of and taking advantage of the fourth industrial revolution, we are at the same time faced with what has been termed wicked problems, problems that are complex, multifaceted, interdependent, non-linear, layered, persistent, and also intractable. In our country, the troubled problems of poverty, unemployment, and inequality can be described as part of the wicked problems. But there are others 
that are playing out on a global scale, such as climate change, a rising conservatism, and so forth and so on. How do we harness the fourth industrial revolution as an opportunity to assist in addressing the wicked problems that confront us? With the technologies that are coming to the fore, such as artificial intelligence, robotics, big data, the Internet of Things, blockchain, assist us to address the problems that confront us or deepen it or deepen those problems. Is the advent of the fourth industrial revolution a crossroads, I mean a crossroads moment for higher education in our country but also in the world? And how should higher education be responding to this? These are key questions that all of us are grappling with and are also questions that the task team that uh, we have set up on the, impl on the implement, implement, Im implications of the fourth industrial revolution for post-school education and training has been tasked to address. And already a range of issues have come to the fore that must be taken uh, account of by the task team and by the university sector. The world of work is changing. Hardly a day goes by without news of additional jobs that are lost. Globally, research is showing that some jobs are disappearing and new jobs are appearing and, uh, and, and that the balance is still a positive. In fact, according to the International Labour Organization, we, we would uh, possibly have more jobs, uh, net jobs, in the next uh, 20 to 25 years as a result of the fourth industrial revolution. So in other words, the number of new jobs that are being created outweigh those that are being lost. But this is not likely to be the case in South Africa and countries of the, of, uh, uh, the same or similar uh, economies and economic structures, where the pace of creation of the new jobs is lower and the skills to occupy uh, the new work positions are not in place. Research in the South African context shows that low-skill uh, jobs that are very difficult or very expensive to automate are increasing. Mid-level jobs that are characterized by routine and which can easily be automated and digitized are disappearing. And high skills jobs, including jobs that necessarily involve human-to-human uh, uh, -human interaction, are growing. In our country, we are therefore likely to be facing a growing skills mismatch with more high-level jobs becoming available and insufficient number of people being able to fill in those jobs. Therefore, training is not well aligned with skills needs. Employers are requiring that new graduates are work-ready, but not necessarily work-ready as in ready to perform a specific job. Rather, work ready as in possessing the range of so-called soft skills that will enable adaptability to changing work environment and changing work demands. Skills such as being a lifelong learner, agility and flexibility, self-regulations, multitasking, communication skills, digital skills, ability to work in cross-functional multidisciplinary teams, and, ad and, ad and adopting an entrepreneurial mindset. The gig economy, as it is popularly known, enables people to pursue work opportunities in multiple areas and will and with multiple employers without being tied down to, specific, to a specific employer. Employers are looking beyond formal qualifications in their recruitment process and are recognizing learning that has taken place outside of formal learning settings, including learning opportunities offered directly by industries and the private sector. In addition to formal qualifications, short learning programs and platform-based learning are being recognized for employment purposes. Digital badging and micro-credentialing are becoming recognized as legitimate evidence of learning. How do our formal accreditation and recognition system interface with this changing world of work and the demands of, uh, uh, of employers? A curriculum response in universities is obviously required but what form should it take learning is happening differently students are increasingly requiring learning through and with technology uh, and i think an important emphasis here that technology should not necessarily replace our traditional forms of uh, uh, learning and teaching but should rather complement what uh, is uh, uh, currently uh, existing because for some reason uh, you know when we speak about the relationship between 
uh, uh, you know, fourth industrial revolution, artificial in intelligence, and learning. People seem to think that we can replace your traditional lecturer with a robot and that things will just go on as it should. I actually think that uh, you know, all of these new developments should necessarily be aimed at complementing rather than uh, being seen as replacing what is currently uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 existing. And, and, and thirdly, uh, new uh, technologies which will allow for innovation in education delivery, a teaching and learning response in universities is also required, but also what form uh, should this take? New and advanced technologies are spawning and in enabling new areas of inquiry, which in turn leads to new discoveries and innovation. Access to big data enables persistent problems, which, uh, as I referred to them earlier, the wicked problems, to be looked at in new ways and in multi and transdisciplinary ways. A research and innovation response in universities is required, but also what form should this uh, you know, re research and innovation response take? We need to locate our response to the threats and the opportunities that the fourth industrial revolution poses within the realities that currently confront the world, our country, and our continent, as well as within the future trajectory where we see ourselves. For an example, it's not realistic to imagine the development of smart cities if we ensure that in creating the smart cities, we uh, also work to ensure sustainable livelihoods meaningful lifestyle and equip equitable opportunity for the people who will occupy those smart cities. But we also have to be mindful of the threats and work actively to mitigate these threats. Internet penetration, access to technology and to data is highly uneven and data itself still remains costly uh, in countries such as ours. And in a context where new and advanced learning is required, including retaining Retraining for people whose jobs become obsolete, existing in inequalities can be deepened. The independence of social systems and processes and public privacy is under threat as technology increasingly can be used for monitoring surveillance and the, crea and the creation and distribution of false communication and, as the US president says, fake news. Legislation and policy is not keeping pace with innovation and technological advancement or may even be stifling it. Our investors have a duty to lead in navigating both the threats and the opportunities through research, curriculum, teaching and learning and engagement with communities. And some of the research questions that I think need to be asked includes what are the real risks and opportunities in the African context, in rural context, in economies that are reliant on primary industries, in societies that are characterized by high levels of inequality, including a, sufficient, I mean, a significant digital divide. How will the world of work in Africa change? And what is Africa's niche in this rapidly evolving context? How should higher education be responding uh, to this changing world of work? What are the new programs that we should be introducing at our institutions to ensure that our graduates are equipped to take advantage of these existing opportunities? How can artificial intelligence become part not only of what we teach, but how we teach? Data analytics and student tracking soft software make it possible to provide better levels of support to individual students. How will we take advantage of this as the university community? There are in innovative and new digital learning platforms that are, that are being developed for teaching and learning. Virtual reality applications have the potential to enhance students' learning. The Internet of Things means that students, teachers, and devices are connected in multiple ways that can be drawn on to enable learning. And how would we respond and use this in productive ways? Social media platforms, for instance, enable quality interaction between students and between students and teachers across the physical space. E-books and open education resources have the potential to drop the cost of education delivery substantially and to counteract the huge enterprise that has been built up around copyright tax for students at the expense of students. And as you gather from uh, my reflections here today, we're in a space where there are more questions than there are answers, 
and we look at we look to our universities to assist in constructing responses that are evidence-based and contextually relevant and that positions our countries and our people to equitably take advantage of the opportunities that presents themselves while simultaneously ensuring that our multiple existing challenges are addressed and not deepened. And I'm certain that this symposium will be engaging seriously with these issues and I urge you to share the key understandings that emerge from the symposium, including through providing an input to the ministerial task team through its chair, Professor Villagazi. In building the future university and the future society, we can choose to engage with a radically changing environment from a position of fear or from a position of possibility. We should choose, I believe, a position of possibility. We should ensure that the development that are taking place do not deepen the problems and challenges that we're confronted with, but help us resolve those particular problems and challenges. Thank you for listening.